السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته أما خلي شوية صعب شوية صعب بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أنبياء الله جميعا وعلى سيدهم وخاتمهم حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وكأي من نبي قاتل معه ربيون كثير فما وهنوا لما أصابهم في سبيل الله وما ضعفوا وما استكانوا والله يحب الصابرين وما كان قولهم إلا أن قالوا ربنا اخفر لنا ذنوبنا وإسرافنا في أمرنا وثبت أقدامنا وانصرنا على القوم الكافرين فآتاهم الله ثواب الدنيا وحسن ثواب الآخرة والله يحب المحسنين Enlighten your hearts and your souls with a loud salawat for Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. There are two historical stages in the movement of Islam. One stage is the stage of formation and establishment. When the Islam was in the process of being made and being established. The second is the stage of reformation, restoration, and the fixation of the religion. And there is a difference between these two stages. And the Holy Quran referred to these two stages and two eras by saying in chapter 13 surah al-ra'd innama anta mundhir o muhammad at this stage the stage of beginning the stage of initiation and launching your mission you are only a warner innama anta mundhir however after you begins the second stage and the second era. We will send for every community a guide. So these are two stages. The stage of warning, that is the very first stage, which comes during the time of establishment and formation and the constitution of the religion. While the second stage is followed after many decades, and that is the stage where Islam has to be fixed because Islam was going into the wrong direction by some tyrants who hijacked this religion. What is the difference between these two stages? The difference is in the tactics, the strategies, and also the approaches are different. In the first stage of formation, the stage of growth, the stage of evolution of Islam, Islam has started to crawl and to move slowly, slowly. At that stage, the Prophet has been instructed to be 
ultra lenient ultra lenient and extra forgiving and more tolerant it's the era of mildness and sometimes he had to compromise and sometimes he had to give concessions to his enemies why because it's a matter of existence either existence or non-existence either islam would exist if there is some tolerance if there is a higher level of tolerance and leniency with others but if there is no tolerance islam is going to be crushed and islam is would be unable to be launched and presented to the masses thus the prophet had to be very forgiving not only that in his community in his society people were different some of them were excellent in their characters in their manners in their commitment in their dedication others were not very much so another group they were hypocrites they were enemies they represented the fifth column inside the muslim community they were doing very bad they conspired to destroy this religion from within but the prophet never identified them never ever during his mission of 23 years he stood one day and he said to someone hey i know you you are a hypocrite get out of here never ever and the holy quran tells us that there were hypocrites praying behind him eating with him dining with him living with him going out with him conversing with him and they were all they were called companions and in chapter 9 the holy quran says "O oh muhammad there are some hypocrites that you may know them and some that even you do not know them and i'm not going to tell you who were they god is telling you why because we have to keep the state together it's about unity it's about unity it's about the national security of the state people have to get together even if they don't believe in each other they have to get together one of the leaders of the hypocrites by the name of Abdullah ibn Ubay. He was known to be the leader of the Munafiqeen hypocrites in Medina. In downtown Medina. His house was there in downtown Medina. And he used to come to the mosque. And the Prophet would never say to him, listen, I don't like you. I don't want you to come to my mosque. He never said this to him. The Prophet said, everybody is welcomed. Why? Because we need all the forces today. All of them, those who contribute 100%, with those who give 80%, with those who give 5%, with those who give nothing. We need all of them. They have to get together because we are in the stage of formation. We cannot afford division. We cannot afford disunity. Do you know that sometimes in some of these military excursions that the Prophet would dispatch to defend his estate, the military commander was not sincere. So the Prophet would send two or three people to watch him. Imagine he's the leader of the military excursion, but he's not sincere. So the Prophet sends two or three people to watch him. Why? Because he needed every energy, every bit of force, every individual, every male, every female, every child, every elderly, every citizen to be part of that formation. He would not purge. The Prophet would not purge people based on their faith. Oh, I don't like your faith. I don't like your color. I don't like your gender. I don't like your race. 
I'm going to deport you, I'm going to put you in jail, I'm going to send three million here, five million there. He never said this. They are in the state of formation. They have to get together. Even if they disagree with him, he says, all are welcomed on board. Not only that, the Prophet had to <clears throat> build alliances with non-believers. With non-believers. He had to create treaties with his enemies to avoid war and to avoid conflict. And the Prophet had to marry sometimes women that he did not necessarily like. But it was important for him to marry, to please their families, their parents, their communities. Some of his wives were not very religious, were not very committed. But the Prophet was easygoing. The Prophet said, we are in the stage of formation. This is an equal opportunity religion. Here, if we, if we want to check the faith of people and, all, and pick and choose those who agree with me 100%, I will get them on board. And those who disagree with me, I will throw them away. My faith and my religion and my country and my state is going to be dismantled. And that's not the way I'm going to do things. So in the stage of formation, Ta'sis, Marhalatu Ta'sis. The policy was what? Leniency and tolerance and mildness. Therefore, this book, the Holy Quran tells the Prophet, O Muhammad, walaw kunta fadlan ghalidha al-qalbi lan fadlu min hawlik. If you are harsh-hearted, with your community, if you are tough and brutal, they're going to leave you alone. So don't do that. Be mild, be forgiving. He's the prophet of forgiveness, the prophet of love and compassion. And God says in this book, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ We sent you nothing but a source of mercy for the entire world. The entire universe. Then after that comes the stage of restoration. After the Prophet, Islam started to shift away from the right course. Why? Because some incompetent people assumed leadership. Sometimes the nation, the people chooses the right president, the right person, and sometimes the same nation chooses the wrong person, wrong president. It happened. It happens everywhere. It happens in the secular realm. It happens in the religious realm. It happens everywhere. And then 50 years after the departure of the Prophet وسلم, Islam went 180 degrees in the wrong direction. 180 degrees. Completely in the wrong direction. Because it was hijacked by a group of thugs. Murderers and thugs whose intention was not to build their communities and their people, but to plunder, to steal, to exploit, to dominate, to abuse. Unfortunately, this happened because people did not live up to their responsibilities. When people do not live up to their responsibilities, you get wrong people on board. People took Islam for granted. They thought that since I'm a Muslim, I pray five times a day, I fast in the month of Ramadan, God is going to send me angels to rule over me. God is going to enable me to choose the best ones. No. God chooses the best one for you if you choose that. 
Because God says, you do first, I do second. This is his rule. God would never help anyone unless that person or that community or that family helps itself first. Otherwise, if God wants to help all people, you know, even those who do not like help, he want to be a good God. He would teach them to be lazy, to be incompetent, to do bad, to be disresponsible. God says, I love those who are responsible. Show me you are responsible, I will be responsible with you too. But if you don't want to be responsible, don't wait for help from me. So Islam went into the wrong direction five decades after the departure of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So it comes the time of Imam Hussein and before him his father Imam Ali alayhi sallam. This era now and this stage now is the stage of tasheeh, restoration of Islam. Remember, the first one was formation. This one is not formation. The religion has been established. But unfortunately, this religion was hijacked and exploited by some opportunists. So now, those who come after Muhammad, they would not bring another religion or a new religion. No, they tried to fix the existing one. Islah, reformation. The repairs. And therefore, in this stage, the leader has to be tough. He has to be serious. He has to be serious. It doesn't mean that he should not be tolerant, tolerant, but, but tough at the same time. There is no complete leniency. Why? Because when you come to criminals and you become lenient with them, hmm, you set them free, you don't take them to court, you don't arrest them, would you be able to live in that society? No. That society is going to be turned into what? Into a jungle. And God says we have to restore peace on earth. If people are supposed to worship me, there should be peace. If people are supposed to be good to each other, the husband good to his wife and the wife good to her husband and the kids are good to their parents, then there should be peace. So you have to fix it. You have to fix the broken system. You have to fix it. And once you start fixing, you need discipline. You need to enforce the law to the fullest. No one can get away with any crime. No one. Thus, Imam Ali, when he came to power, between him and the Prophet, there were three leaders before him who succeeded the Prophet. When Imam Ali came after 24 years of the death of the Prophet, the system was broken. The first speech, his inaugural speech was, I will bring back every penny that was stolen from the treasury, Baytul Mal. I'll bring it back to Baytul Mal. I don't care who took it, why they took it, it has to come back to the treasury. Because before him there were nepotism, favoritism and nepotism. The caliph would give money to his friends, to his family members, to those who support him, and he deprives others. Imam Ali said every penny, penny that left the treasury in with injustice has to come back. This is my first policy. This is why many people didn't like him. They said he's too tough. The money is gone. The money we purchased lands, we got married with it, we went on vacations with it. How can we bring it back? He said, I don't care. You have to bring the money back. My system is based on justice. The second thing he said, all those governors, at his time, the Islamic State was huge, was bigger than the United States of America today. When Imam Ali was leader, the size of the Islamic State at that time 
was bigger than the United States of America. He said, all those corrupt governors have to go. No one corrupts works for me. They said to him, but some of them are in this business for 20 years. He said, I don't care. They said, okay, wait one or two years. When you become more powerful and more controlling, then you can kick them out. He said, no, I kick them out from the first day. Why? Because said, أَتُرِيدُونَ أَنْ أَطْلُبَ النَّصْرَ بِالْجَوْءِ Do you want me to practice and to apply justice through injustice? Do you want me to create reforms through corruption? That does not happen. Because someone who's corrupt cannot bring about reforms. And someone who's unjust does not understand the, the meaning of justice. They were unhappy with him. They were unhappy with him. His brother comes. His brother, younger than him, from his father and his mother, his sibling. He was Aqil. His name is Aqil. Aqil said, I have a big family. Now you are the president. Now you are the commander in chief. Now you have all the treasury under your control. And I'm your brother, so give me more money. At that time, they would distribute the money equally among the people. Each person has a salary every month. They go to the treasury department, they receive their salary. They have their names there, and they get their salary. Aqil said, I got my salary, but I want more because my brother is the president. Imam Ali said, no way. No way. You are a citizen. I look at you now, when I'm in office, I look at you as a citizen. True, you are my brother, but that does not permit you to get more money. There is no favoritism, no nepotism in my system. My system is based on justice, justice for all. And imagine Aqil was unhappy with his brother. He left him. He said, then I'm going to leave you. Imam Ali said, if you want to leave me, if you are blackmailing me, intimidating me, I'm not going to give in. If you want to leave me, leave me. This is your problem. So he left his brother. He left him. He went to his arch enemy, Muawiyah, in Damascus. He joined Muawiyah. He left his brother in Kufa and he, he, he went to Damascus to live with Muawiyah because Ali refused to give him one more penny extra than others. His granddaughter, Ali's granddaughter, she came one day, two years old. She picked up some, you know, at that time, the currency was gold and silver. She picked up an item while she was leaving. He ran after her. He catch her and he takes this from her hand. They say, but she's the granddaughter of the caliph. She has a share in this. He said, when her father gets his share, let her enjoy her father's share. This does not belong to her. This is Ali's justice. Thus, people were divided into two groups. Some of them were enchanted by him because of his justice. They were fascinated by him. Some people loved him, those who loved justice. And those who did not like justice, they started hating him. And ultimately, they murdered him. Same thing with Imam Hussein. After him comes his son, Imam Hussein, confronting a tyrant, Yazid ibn Muawiyah. Tyrant who made the country free zone for his corruption. A tyrant who lived in a palace while the majority of his population were homeless. They were hungry, but he lived in a palace with his maids, with his servants, with his extravagant lifestyle. Imam Hussein stood to this man, and this is why we are here tonight. And this is why, my friends, 
20 million people are walking now to his shrine to greet him and salute him and pay tribute to him because of his justice. Because at a time where most people were intimidated, they were afraid, they did not speak, they did not say anything, Imam Hussein stood. He said, I am not going to give up. I am the grandson of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I t take it upon myself to restore this religion, even if it cost my blood and my family and my children. Because I heard my grandfather, the prophet says, if, you, if one day you see a tyrant ruling by the name of God and by the, by the name of Islam, that he's corrupt, he plunders the wealth. He kills the innocent. He deprives his citizens and his people from their freedom and their dignity and their wealth. Then you cannot stand with that tyrant. Then you must fight that tyrant, even if it is cost, even, even if it cost your life and your blood. This is what my father taught me. And Imam Hussein, he said, I am going to fight him with the purest of the people. People who are really sincere, people who are really refined, people who are dedicated, people who are honest. Those who want to join me, they are welcome. Imagine out of millions of people at that time, only 72 people joined him. The rest, they said, sorry, this is too much for us. We have children, we have properties, we have businesses, we have families. We don't want to get killed. We are happy where we are. They refused. At that time, imagine, 1400 years ago, this year, it was 1,377 years, exactly. 1,377 years since the day of Ashura, since the day Imam Hussein was murdered in the land of Karbala. Imagine at that day, only 72 people were willing to join him and stand by him and support him, and they gave their lives. Today, millions of people worldwide. Millions of people worldwide. They are ready to give their blood for Hussein. They go to his shrine. Now that I speak to you, watch televisions in Iraq and see what is happening. People walk for hundreds of kilometers, walking, not riding. Among them, elderly, women, children, infants and they all say labbayka ya hussein oh hussein we are here to support you we are with you ya hussein you are not alone if people abandoned you 1377 years ago we are not going to abandon you we are with you hussein chose the purest and he gave his son who was the oldest one, 27 years old, Ali al Akbar. And he gave the youngest one, who was only six months old. They were murdered right before his eyes. And he didn't give up. He didn't say, oh God, you've forsaken me. What is happening to me? The more he gave, the more his face was glowing. This is exactly how they described him in the battlefield. The more he lost one of his companions and family members, the happier he gets. Why? Because he knows he's getting closer to God. And God is his ultimate destination, not this life. This life is short-lived. 
We live in this life for 60 years, 70 years, 90 years. Then we have to go. Then we have to go back to God. He didn't succumb. He never said, I'm in pain. Never ever. And he was crying for his enemies because they are not because they are murdering him, but because they are destroying themselves with their own misfortune, with their own evil deeds. He felt sad for them. Imam Hussein chose the purest. Do you know that when they murdered him, he was thirsty. They didn't give him water for two days. And then when Hussein was killed, few hours after his murder, the army of Bani Umayyah, they decided that since there are no more men in his camp, let's go and give his children some water. So they brought the water and they called upon the kids, hear the water, come, you've been deprived from this water for two days. Now you are free to drink. None of them moved forward. They stood there, please. An army sergeant called. He said, aren't you thirsty? You are kids. They said, yes, we are thirsty. But we are not going to drink because our father died thirsty. One of the kids... While the others were standing, she runs towards the soldier to get a cup of water. The other kids, they looked at her, surprised. Why she's not with us? But when she took the cup of water, rather than coming back to the camp, she went to the battlefield. The soldier said to her, where do you go? She said, when my father left me in the morning, he was thirsty. I'm taking the, the water to my father. The soldier said to her, but your father is dead. When she heard that, she threw the water. She said, if my father dies of thirst, his daughter is not going to drink this water. Imam Hussein chose the purest. The purest among women, among children, among men. The purest. They carried his head. On the way to Damascus, they passed by a church. In that church, there was a priest. The priest noticed that the head of Imam Hussein, they are carrying the head atop a lance. The head is not normal. The severed head, the head is separated from the body, but is still fresh, glowing, shining with light. So he said to the soldiers, whose head is this? They arrogantly answered him. They said his name is Hussein. He said, what Hussein? Who's Hussein? They said, Hussein, whose father, whose mother? They said his father is called Ali, his mother is Fatima. He said, isn't he the grandson of your prophet Muhammad? They were embarrassed. The priest is asking them. One of them said, yes. He said, are you serious? He's the grandson of your prophet, and this is how you deal with him? You sever his head from his body? Why? What, did, what wrong he did? They had no answer. He said to them, listen, please, I want you to leave this head with me tonight in my church. Give me the head. They said, no, we cannot give you the head. We're going to be punished. We have to take it to the caliph in Damascus. He said, please leave it with me. I, all what I have is 10,000 dirham. 10,000 dirham. This is my saving. I can give you this money. Leave the head of this man with me in my monastery, in my church. Because they were greedy. They took the money, 10,000. They said, okay, enjoy the head. Enjoy it. Give us the money. He brought the head inside the church. He put it in front of him. He washed the head and he said, Hussein, I am sorry for what happened to you. I'm a Christian, but I love you. I love you and I believe in you. And please 
When you meet your grandfather Muhammad, say to him, give him my salam and my greetings, and say to him, Ana ashhadu Allah ilaha illa Allah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And then he kept the head with him, crying the whole night. In the morning, they knocked at the door and they said to him, give us the head back. Imagine the several head of this man, what he did with people who were non-Muslims, but some Muslims who called themselves Muslims. What did they do to Hussein and his family? In Damascus, one of the kids who was only five years old, by the name of Ruqayya, she, she's awakened in the middle of the night, missing her father, only five years old. Then he calls upon her aunt, Auntie Amma, I need my father today, I haven't seen him for a while. Her aunt Zainab did not have an answer to give her. She said to her, my sweetie Ruqayya, you know your dad is traveling. It means that he is traveling to the hereafter, to the next life. But she kept insisting, I need daddy, I need daddy, I saw him in my dream. When she was crying, the whole camp was crying with her. All women, all widows, all orphans of Imam Hussein's caravan. The entire city of Damascus was asleep at that time. But they when heard this wailing coming and the cries and the screams coming from the camp of Imam Hussein, these cries reached the palace of the tyrant. He was in his bed. He woke up. He said, what is happening? Why? They said, a baby of Imam Hussein, she woke up asking for her father. He said, no problem. Take her the head of her father. Let her enjoy the head of her father, Hussein. They put it in a tray. They covered the tray. They brought the tray to the camp. They put it before this little lady, little girl. She removed the cover. First she said, I'm not hungry. Why do you bring me a tray of food? They said, no, this is not food. This is what you are searching for. When she removed the cover, she saw the head of Imam Hussein. She cried, Ya Hussein. Abataah man alladhi qata'a al-raas al-sharif. Abataah man alladhi khadzaba al-shayb al-afif. Abataah man alladhi aytamani ala sighar al-sinni. Who killed you, daddy? Why? Why they did this to you? You are a wonderful father. You are a generous father. You are compassionate. You are loving. Why did they deprive me in my childhood from my father's protection and my father's love? She kept saying, daddy, daddy, until she died. She died there in the spot and she's buried there. And even this five years old daughter, now she's a Kaaba. She's the center of love in Damascus. People go there and pay tribute to her. This is the family of Hussein. Their men were heroes. Their women were heroes. His five years old daughter was hero. And we will continue on these stories, on these stories, inshallah, tomorrow evening and Saturday, inshallah ta'ala. Assalamu ala al Hussein. وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته والفاتحة مع الصلوات